They really did an exceptional job. It is both a pleasure and an honor to introduce Congressman Richard Neal as our distinguished speaker. Congressman Richard Neal has long been an outstanding advocate for the city of Springfield and the first congressional district of Massachusetts. Congressman Neal has deep roots in the city. He was educated in Springfield and served on the city council and as mayor before running for election in the House of Representatives in 1988. During his tenure as mayor and throughout his service as representative, Congressman Neal has been a strong champion for the city of Springfield and the Springfield Museums. As mayor, he supported capital improvements to our landmark museum buildings through financial contributions from the city. And as a congressman, he has brought millions and millions of dollars to beautify the area around our museum district through improvements to State Street, the transformation of Technical High School, and the building of the magnificent Federal Courthouse. Congressman Neal was also responsible for securing funding for the Heritage Park improvements for the Dr. Seuss National Memorial Sculpture Garden. More recently, Congressman Neal has been instrumental in our efforts to commemor commemorate the 100th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's birth. He served as the honorary co-chair for the Camelot Gala for the opening of the exhibitions in December and has helped the museums forge connections with the JFK Library in Boston and members of the Kennedy family. Given his involvement, it is fitting that he present today's lecture for the closing celebration. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Richard Neal to the museums. Thank you, Kay, very much, and, and thanks to all of you that uh, have come out as the Museums Association concludes their tribute to John Kennedy, and to uh, be here in uh, Demur Finance, Fine Arts uh, Center is uh, really moving for me. It's one of Springfield's great families, and they've been, I think, uh, terrific over many years in the support that they have lent, not just to the Museums Association, to many of the other endeavors that uh, they are asked to undertake. And, I was the speaker, I think, at the 50th uh, anniversary of the founding of Big Y, and I think I was the speaker at the uh, celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Big Y. And, <laughs> and uh, Jerry DeBoer was about this big, if you remember, and he got up and he was just so excited that night at the 50th anniversary, and as he introduced me, he said, I have never heard anybody say a bad word about this man. And I said to him, I'll get you a list. <laughs> <laughs> So I do want to thank, uh, thank all of you, and I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, this event caused me to revisit uh, Teddy White's epic, The Making of the President, 1960. And whether you watch the grainy film footage or you read the text that uh, Teddy White immortalized as he explained the events of uh, 1960, I think that we all uh, have a better understanding of the role that not just history plays, but the understanding of what those who write history inform us of and how important that, that endeavor was. And it caused me to go back and really uh, review it very carefully. So I want to thank the museums in the Quadrangle. This association is a testament to the brilliance of the city of Springfield, its taxpayers, to the rich benefactors who have participated here, and also to those of you who have over many, many years supported these museums. I can tell you from my days as a member of the City Council to the Mayor's Office and to Congress, we need to remind ourselves, for a city this size, to have the elegant art supply that we have, it's unmatched anywhere else, and it's a great credit to all of you who have been so supportive. And I, I'm delighted again to accept the invitation to discuss, discuss the life and legacy of our 35th President, John Kennedy. Last year certainly marked the 100th anniversary of the President's birth, and there were a series of important events and presentations here in Massachusetts and across the country to celebrate JFK's centennial year. The Springfield Museums contributed to this year-long observance by hosting this exhibit, Jack and Jackie, the Kennedys in the White House, in a unique partnership with the Smithsonian Institute, the National Museum of American History, Kennedy Library, which I've had the honor of serving as a trustee, and Kay Simpson and her staff really did a spectacular job in putting together this remarkable collection of photographs, artifacts, and memorabilia that chronicle the Kennedy family's 1,000 days in the White House. 
There is even a recreation of the Oval Office complete with a replica of JFK's resolute desk. And since it opened in December, the exhibit has been one of the most successful displays here at the Quadrangle in recent memories. Galleries in the museum have literally been filled with visitors, young and old, who want to remember the promise of Camelot. It's a testimony, again, to the enduring appeal of Jack Kennedy and the belief that he left us far too soon. As this bedazzling display, I think, wraps up today, I want to once, once again congratulate Kay Simpson, who was very modest in acknowledging others here and her staff for the great work that they did. As many of you know, my career, like uh, tens of thousands of others, was inspired by John Kennedy. I was lucky enough to see him on the day before the presidential election in 1960 when he visited Springfield on November 7th, the day before the presidential election. My mother, who was long gone for Kennedy, suggested that we be kept home from school that day so that we could go to Court Square to see John Kennedy. And I remember my grandmother taking us down Lyman Street, from where they lived on Taylor Street, and walking to Court Square. My mother was a switchboard operator at the City Hall. And I remember that moment when 30,000 people assembled to watch history being made. Remember that he only made three stops on that day before the election. He visited Waterbury, Connecticut, Springfield. It was on to perhaps the most tumultuous welcome that he had been given during the campaign that night in Boston. Kennedy arrived in that setting in a motorcade with Congressman Edward Boland, Judge Dan Keyes, two legendary figures in Western Mass and two people that have been very good to me over the course of my career. Standing on that steps of the bell tower was also Mayor Tom O'Connor, who people might not remember was the Senate nominee that year against Leverett Saltonstall. Kennedy gave a passionate closing argument and said that the United States could achieve any of its goals in the 1960s if it acted with purpose and perseverance. It was a moment I certainly will never forget. The very next day, John Kennedy became the president-elect of the United States. But remember the margin of that victory. He won by 118,550 votes out of 69 million that had been cast, or a margin of one-tenth of one percent. He defeated Vice President Nixon with a clear majority in the Electoral College by a vote of 309 to 219. However, the thin margin on the popular side was forever debated. It was one of the closest elections in U.S. history, and I still remember the next morning waking with great excitement in our household to watch Vice President Nixon offer his concession speech on television. It's hard to believe that that's 10 presidents ago. Like so many others of my generation, I was influenced by John Kennedy's youth, energy, and confidence. He suggested public service was an honorable calling. I agreed with him then, and I agree with him now. It It was in that 1960 campaign for president that my interest began to flow and take root. That's when I began to think seriously about a career in public service. As a young man, I was familiar with Jack Kennedy. How could you not be here in Massachusetts and indeed the legendary family that he was part of? I was knowledgeable about his courage during World War II and how he helped save the crew of the South Pacific, in the South Pacific, on the PT-109. I knew he had served three terms in the United States House of Representatives, and I listened to his Senate speeches and remembered that he had defeated Henry Cabot Lodge in 1952 in a race that most thought he could not prevail in until election night. I think we're all reminded in his candidacy in those years that he understood one man, indeed, or one woman can make a difference. But I also like to look back and think of the great sense of humor that was frequently immortalized in the press conferences where his wit and wisdom were always on display. And the people I mentioned earlier, like Boland, Keyes, and Ryan, and Larry O'Brien, and Joe Napolitan, that's where they made their mark, and how lucky I was to have been part of that legacy and the advice that they offered to me over the course of my career. I always think of the one funny story that I'm sure Jack Kennedy embellished but told with great 
fervor, always to great laughter as well. He said as he stood in the Charlestown Navy Yard, shaking hands as we all would do at that time, because you would get three shifts with the local union president. So you could stand there at the morning, evening shift, and the midnight shift. So it was an easy piece of work for a couple of hours. But Kennedy said as he was standing in the line receiving greeters, a fellow said to him, Kennedy, I'd never vote for you. You've never worked a day in your life. And the fellow right behind him said, Kennedy, I'm definitely voting for you because you haven't missed a thing. <laughs> These were moments of possibility and idealism was rampant. The country was about to enter the new frontier. I began to follow the primaries closely and knew one day that this was the sort of challenge that I would be interested in. Remember that it was in a losing effort at the convention in 1956 when almost on a whim he sought the vice presidency against the wishes of his father, but decided that that might provide him with traction for a future campaign. And indeed, it did because they spent the next four years planning for a presidential race. There were two seminal events in the campaign that helped to change the course of American history. After declaring his candidacy on January 2nd in the U.S. Senate caucus room, now the Kennedy caucus room, he ran up a series of early primary victories in the spring. New Hampshire, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Indiana against his principal opponent, a very good human being, Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. The only close race was in Wisconsin and the Kennedy people couldn't figure it out because they thought that that would be the one primary that would put them over the top. And what they couldn't figure out was whether or not the religious issue had raised its ugly head again or whether or not it was the fact that the side of Wisconsin that voted for Hubert Humphrey was closest to Minnesota. And they decided they had to press ahead with some, at that moment, uncertain data. The national media at that moment, though, began once again to cryptically refer to the so-called religious issue. And by the time the West Virginia primary took place on May 10th, anti-Catholic literature and the materials were being distributed to voters across the state. And recall that 95% of West Virginia's population at that time, they were Protestants. To his credit, Kennedy addressed the issue directly and without hesitation. Quote, Nobody asked if I was a Catholic when I joined the United States Navy, he told the crowd in Morgantown. Quote, are 40 million Americans denied the right to be president on the day that they are baptized, he asked. His candor struck a chord with the voters, and he went on to win an overwhelming victory in the state of West Virginia, defeating Senator Humphrey by more than 20 percentage points, 60.8 to 39.2 percent. That victory secured the Democratic nomination. Following the convention in Los Angeles in July, where the individuals that I mentioned a moment ago were all delegates, he chose Lyndon Johnson to be his running mate. And Kennedy once again had to confront the issue of separation of church and state. He kept trying to put the issue aside, kept hoping it would get better without talking about it, which we all frequently do in our own lives, because the answer will get better if we don't talk about it. The logic escapes most of us in the rearview mirror, but at the moment, it frequently sounds good. He chose the state of Texas and the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, a large and influential group of Protestant ministers. But once again, he pulled no punches with his audience. Quote, I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president who happens to be Catholic. I do not speak for my church on public matters, and the church does not speak for me. Knowing his geography, he cleverly brought up a local shrine, telling the audience of Texans, quote, for side by side with Bowie and Crockett died McCafferty, Bailey, and Carey. But no one knows whether they were Catholic or not because there were no religious tests at the Alamo. It was a statement on religious liberty as strong as Thomas Jefferson's Wall of Separation letter to a Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. On that day in September, Kennedy displayed the type of leadership and character that would become the hallmark of his presidency, and he received a standing ovation upon concluding the speech. Many believe it was the tipping point in the campaign 
because he finally was able to put the question of dual loyalty and faith to rest. Most Americans of my generation have vivid memories of the Kennedy-Nixon debates in the fall of 1960. Let me give you a number here. 77 million people watched those debates between the two candidates. Nearly 60% of the country's population tuned in to watch those debates. Because of their historical importance, they are often compared to the famous debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas in 1858. For those listening on the radio, they thought Vice President Nixon had performed better in the debates. But on television, the difference between the two men was striking. Kennedy was healthy and confident. He was telegenic, talked directly into the camera, and as we all know, was very good at thinking on his feet. By contrast, Vice President Nixon appeared more uncertain. He refused to wear makeup. The debates were a game changer again in 1960. Kennedy simply outshined the Vice President on the stage. He understood the new medium of television and mass media better than most and used it to his advantage. It was a critical victory as well in his victory over Vice President Nixon in the general election just weeks later. The debates also ushered in a new era of political communication where television became more important than newspapers and radio. And you looked important if you said something in the right way. I'm not sure that that has served as well in on ensuing years. Upon taking office, Kennedy issued a memorable call to arms to the American people. Quote, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what you, I'm sorry, ask what you can do for your country. Those words continue to reverberate around the globe five decades later. I believe that Kennedy's inaugural address ranks in the top three in American history, following the remarkable words of Lincoln in his second inaugural address on the east side of the Capitol he welcomed the nine states of the Confederacy back to Union after four years of a civil war in which 2% of the American people had been murdered. But it's still the elevation of that speech that ought to remind us all of the importance of the American family when he said, with malice toward none and charity for all. Or Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural address when 25% of the American people were without work and he suggested we only have fear to fear for, it, for itself. He understood the modern era and how one uses words to create imagery. When he spoke of America's role in the world, Kennedy challenged a generation to indeed give something back. Those are perfect examples of the power of language. For those of us in the audience, I can tell with some of the gray hair that we have, we still have great regard for completed sentences. <laughs> Finished paragraphs. And we adore the Oxford comma. Who knows how many people he inspired or continues to inspire with the one powerful statement, of, ask not. I count myself among the millions of Americans who entered public service because of that challenge. For me, his inaugural address and time in the White House was that shining moment of unlimited idealism and hope. The person who helped to give me my start in pol political life, former Mayor Bill Sullivan, always talked about standing outside and watching that inauguration. It was one of the high marks of his career as well. Jack Kennedy was the first president born in the 20th century, and he brought a certain grace, style, and elegance to the White House. He also, as I noted earlier, always was capable of giving the great one-liner. One evening at a dinner honoring Nobel laureates, Kennedy told the group, quote, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent of human knowledge that has ever been gathered at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. When asked by a young boy how he became a war hero, Kennedy replied, it was absolutely involuntary. <laughs> they sank my boat. He was an unconventional politician in his time and America's first modern president who had the ability to really laugh at himself. And people came to admire that quality. There's an old lore in Catholicism that says when you enter a Catholic church for the first time that you're granted three wishes. When Kennedy did that in Ohio, he came out and a reporter said, what were the three wishes? And without missing a beat, Kennedy said, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. <laughs> he and the First Lady Jackie Kennedy also defied wisdom in the change they brought to art and culture in the White House. 
Robert Frost read the poem at the inaugural ceremonies, and I still remember the President of the United States, Jack Kennedy, getting up to shield his eyes on that snowy morning because of the reflection coming off the snow that made it almost impossible for Frost to read the poem. Tell us Pablo Casals played a famous concert in the East Room. Legendary performers like Leonard Bernstein, Igor Stravinsky, and Isaac Stern all performed during his presidency. When asked what President Kennedy's favorite musical selection was, Jackie Kennedy quipped, hail to the chief. <laughs> he was an early supporter of what eventually became the National Endowment of the Arts. And by the way, this week, there was a generous infusion of new money for the National Endowments for the Arts and PBS. <laughs> it's no coincidence in Washington that the JFK Center is home to a living memorial to the 35th president. Shortly after his inauguration, Kennedy fulfilled a campaign promise and established the Peace Corps. One of the nicest things that happened to me today when I came in, the fellow said, I came from Chester, Massachusetts because I was a member of the Peace Corps. Would you stand up so we can give you a round of applause as well? <laughs> and if there's anybody here from Vista or the Peace Corps, we want to acknowledge you as well. Please stand a round of applause as well. It was an initiative that gave young people an opportunity to serve their country as ambassadors of peace and social progress. During the Cold War era, the idea of sending tens of thousands of American college students around the world promoting democracy was indeed bold. But the program run by his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, became extraordinarily successful. Kennedy told his volunteers that they were the face of America abroad, a reminder in America that it should always be the power of our example not just the example of our power. Five decades later, five decades later, 200,000 Peace Corps volunteers have served in 140 nations globally. The program has been transformative and impactful. It has won the hearts and minds of many in the underdeveloped world. And as members of Congress, year after year, continue to support the Peace Corps, it is one of the better votes that we all annually have a chance to cast. There is no federal agency that has been more effective in promoting our nation's values on the world stage than the Peace Corps. And Kennedy's commentary was simple. If we do not help the many of our poor, we will never save the few who are rich. During his State of the Union address in 1963, Kennedy spoke about his plans to create the domestic Peace Corps, VISTA, a volunteer program that would address our community programs and needs here at home. He told Congress that, quote, the idealism of our youth has served world peace so now it must serve domestic tranquil tranquility. While President Kennedy did not live to see his idea come to pass, VISTA, or Volunteers in Service to America, created in 1965, has been working to eradicate poverty neighborhood by neighborhood ever since. It is now called AmeriCorps, and it continues to provide ordinary citizens with diverse service opportunities to improve the lives and strengthen communities in every state in our nation. It's another example of President Kennedy encouraging the American people to be responsible citizens, and indeed, to give something back. Always mindful of the privilege he had been born into in life, he used to quote regularly the notion, to those who much has been given, much is expected. During the 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a fierce competition called the Space Race. It was a contest between two Cold War rivals for the dominance of space flight capability. Concerned that the U.S. was falling behind after the Soviet Union had begun and become the first country to successfully send a man into space and orbit the Earth, Yuri Gagarin, in April of 1961, President Kennedy stood before Congress one month later and said, quote, this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. He made a, na a national priority of that endeavor, and he asked Americans to join him in support of this ambitious new goal. He was challenging us to do big things. He knew that such an improbable idea would bring out the best in America. And he was refreshingly candid when he said going to the moon would not be easy. Indeed, it would be hard. At the same time, and remember this is important, the United States only had 15 minutes of manned space time when Alan Shepard became the first American on a suborbital flight. 
NASA had been created just three years earlier as a federal agency with the primary responsibility for the development of civilian aerospace research. In a speech at Rice University in 1962, Kennedy gave one of the most memorable speeches of his presidency when he told the 40,000 people in the audience that space exploration was going to be one of the highest priorities in his administration. He stressed how important it was for the United States to beat the Soviets in the space race, both from a technological and military perspective. It also would give the country a great psychological lift. On all accounts and against all odds, he was right. John Glenn manned the first American orbital flight a few short months after Kennedy's speech at Rice. In the mid-1960s, two-man crews of the Gemini spacecraft flew 10 successful missions around the Earth. And on July 20th, 1969, six years after the President Kennedy's death, Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the moon as part of the Apollo 11 team. It was a huge victory for America over our Cold War rivals. It was a sense of national purpose, and it had been a call to action. Think about some of the things we would not have today without space travel. Satellite TV, laptops, camera phones, CAT scans, clean energy technology, GPS, which is still managed by the American government and day-to-day -day laid out by the United States Air Force, water purification, home insulation, wireless headsets, freeze-dried food, and baby formulas, to name but a few. Nearly 60 years after President Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon, space technology continues to drive our economy and improve our lives. It's why I still believe in this notion, and I hope all Americans share my, my sense of thought on this. America can always afford a big science project. It's a call to unity. And about 15 years ago, I was the only member of the Massachusetts congressional delegation to vote to save the space station, and it held on by one vote. Thanks, Jack Kennedy. Space was not the only place where President Kennedy confronted the Soviet Union. Remember, he was a man of his time, and I think one of the dangers of the arguments that we frequently have in America today is the argument over presentism. We think that somehow you can take the events of previous centuries and simply employ or plug them into current debates without the perspective of why they thought what they did at that particular time, correctly or incorrectly. And John Kennedy was certainly a Cold Warrior. In 1962, an American spy plane photographed the Soviets secretly building nuclear missile sites 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Kennedy ordered a naval blockade around Cuba to prevent Russian ships from bringing more military supplies to the island. For the 13 days, the world was on the brink of nuclear war, and in public schools here in Springfield, we practiced what to do by getting underneath our desks in anticipation of what could go awry. One bad moment followed another, but thanks to his measured leadership, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev finally agreed to President Kennedy's demand to remove the missiles from the island, and the Cuban Missile Crisis came to a peaceful conclusion. Secretary of State Dean Russ said at the time, quote, we were eyeball to eyeball, and I think the other fellow just blinked. It also began an opportunity for more peaceful dialogue between the two superpowers. It was one of the crowning achievements of the Kennedy presidency. Another of his important accomplishments was civil rights, which he saw as a moral, legal, and constitutional issue. During the, his administration, he sent the National Guard to enforce the segregation of schools and universities across the South. He had federal marshals protect the Freedom Riders, and in June of 1963, he told the American people that he would send a comprehensive civil rights bill to the Congress for passage. Quote, the heart of the question, Kennedy said, was whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and opportunity. The bill passed a year after his death. I recall that television broadcast when he said this debate was as old as the scriptures, how important that has been to America in trying to erase one of the great stains on our history. During his presidency, John Kennedy led a new generation of Americans into the 20th century. He inspired millions to enter public service. He promoted human rights around the globe, and he challenged us all to be more than we simply wanted to be. His grip on our memory remains strong. 
and accomplished, as I noted, sending a man to the moon within a decade from the time he outlined the challenge. He helped to prevent a war, stood up for civil rights. He was instrumental in the establishment of programs that make a difference in our lives every single day, as we've outlined, and also not to miss the Alliance for Progress. It's in this legacy, in this great, great sense of optimism and hope that keeps Jack Kennedy's memory fresh in all of our minds. It's remarkable that decades after his time in office, Kennedy still has the ability to capture our hopes and our imagination. As we recognize the 100th anniversary of President Kennedy's birth, it's hard to envision Jack Kennedy at 100 years old. Our observation of him will always be for every young and 43 years old the night that he got elected. So I want to take this time again to thank the Museums Association. I want to thank them for the collection of photographs from Richard Avedon, thank the museums that have participated collaboratively with them, and also to remember Jackie Kennedy, who was equally vibrant and charismatic. On behalf of all of you and all of us here in Springfield that helped launch this career to bring him to the 35th presidency in our nation, grateful for your continued support. Last Friday, on a visit to Newport News in Virginia to see the next round of submarines that are being constructed, largely because they have a very important contract in Warren, Massachusetts with Warren Pump, I went there and toured the Naval Yard the better part of the morning. And one of the things that they wanted me to see, which will be commissioned in the year 2019, is the USS John Kennedy. Thank you all from the United States of America.